Hey everyone, what is going on? Welcome back to another video here on the channel. In this week's video, we're gonna be talking about eight common issues with power system components. Now we're gonna be discussing the issue at hand and then I'm gonna get into ways that we can actually avoid this issue or fix this issue so that it does not no longer happen to us. So another point to make about these eight items is that I've really not put them in any particular order. With this in mind, let's get started and talk about our first item on the list. Item number one on the list is overloading of our power system components. Now ultimately we are overloading our power system components when we are asking that component to do more than it was designed to do in the first place. This is going to result in a bunch of heat that is produced from that component. Now ways that we can actually reduce the amount of load that these components are under is by reducing the amount of teeth, for example, on a radio controlled car pinion gear. If we reduce the amount of pinion gear teeth on the motor there, we can reduce the amount of load that our components are experiencing. Now you can reduce the amount of load on your radio controlled airplane as well just by simply going down to a smaller size of propeller. It will accomplish the exact same thing. Now one of the things that we should be doing is measuring the temperature of each one of our power system components. If we're doing this correctly, we'll know if we are actually overloading our power system component. Now this is a great segue into item number two of our list here today, and that deals with overheating of power system components. Now obviously overloading is very closely related to overheating as we just described that. Now when we overheat a component, if this happens in excess, we can actually permanently damage that component and render it useless. This can be a very expensive thing to have happen to us, so it is very important to make certain that we are checking the temperatures of our brushless motor, our brushless electronic speed control, and our lithium Palmer battery pack. We can do this by using a temp gun. Now a good rule of thumb for us is to make certain that none of our power system components, if we don't have any access to a manual that tells us otherwise, should be 140 Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius. This is absolutely important for the lithium polymer battery pack and should be treated as an absolute maximum for temperatures on that battery. As for the brushless motor and the electronic speed control, using a temperature of 140 Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius should be a very conservative value and allow us to get tons of life out of both of those components. As we've talked about in overloading of components, we are going to overheat a component component if we are asking of that component to do more than what it has been designed to do. In these cases, if you do have a component that is overheating, reduce the amount of load within your power system so that you can fix this issue. Now let's jump into item number three on our list, which deals with battery related issues. Now I'm gonna dive specifically into one battery specific issue that comes up quite frequently. And this primarily deals with radio control cars and specifically with brushless sensorless motors. This is an item that comes up when you're trying to accelerate your car from stop, get it moving, and then accelerate up to the speed that you're trying to drive your radio control vehicle at. Now what happens in this process is the electronic speed control doesn't really know the position of the brushless motor. And in order to figure out the position of that brushless motor, one of the things the speed control needs to do is send a ton of power to the motor to help it figure out as part of its own process. Now in this situation, when you're pushing a lot of power to the motor, it's drawing all this power obviously from your battery pack. If your battery pack is not up to the task of delivering that kind of power to your power system, you're going to have a whole bunch of voltage drop. Now what happens if you do have a bunch of voltage drop is the voltage goes below the threshold for your low voltage cutoff that is programmed onto the ESC and you're going to have that ESC cut the power to the brushless motor. What this is going to look like for you if you're driving this radio control car is that the motor tries to get going, it does, it seems like it just caught and synced up and accelerated and then all of a sudden cut out. If this is something that you're seeing, you might be experiencing this type of battery related issue. 
Now, what's actually happening as the root cause of this specific issue, if this is what's happening to you, is your battery's not up to the task of delivering the correct amount of power and it's having a bunch of voltage drop. Now, the way to fix this is simply just by purchasing a brand new battery. You can do that by increasing the amount of capacity within the battery or increasing the C rating of that battery. Both of these items is going to allow that battery to perform better in comparison to the previous battery that you were using. One last point here before we move on to make is that you want to make sure that you have a battery that is of good quality and has a good reputation out there in the RC world. Now let's move on to item number four on the list which deals with motor cogging. Now cogging is a term that is specifically used primarily in the RC hobby. And this is really when, you know, related to the last item that we talked about, when the motor and the speed control are trying to get in sync one another in a sensorless power system. Power is transferred from the electronic speed control to the motor, and if that motor is not in the correct position for that power, you get this sort of stuttering type action on the radio control vehicle. For the most part, cogging is not really an issue, but if it begins to be excessive, this is where it becomes more and more of an issue. If this is something that's happening to you in excess where you pull the trigger, it's stuttering until finally it syncs up and accelerates the vehicle as normal, there are a few things that you're going to be able to do to to fix the issue, help with the issue, or even completely eliminate the issue. The first item to consider if you want to reduce the amount of cogging is looking into the pinion gear that you're using on your brushless motor. For example, if you're using a 27 tooth pinion, you can reduce that to either, let's say a 24 or 25 tooth pinion, and then test that to see if that improved the amount of cogging that you're experiencing. Another item to consider is looking at the battery. Just like the last item that we talked about on our list, having a good quality battery so that the ESC can pull a significant amount of power when it's going through this process is going to help make the process easier on your power system. And lastly, if we want to ultimately completely eliminate the amount of cogging that we see, we can move to a brushless censored motor and this will get rid of this synchronization process altogether and we will no longer deal with this issue. Let's now jump into our next item on the list which deals with power wire connection points from our ESC to our brushless motor. Now this type of issue that comes up could actually disguise itself as cogging, but it's very important to understand the difference of what would be happening in this issue versus cogging. When we're dealing with a power wire connection issue, what we're going to see with our brushless motor is more of like a vibration and that vibration is going to be very consistent where it's going to start vibrating and really what's happening is the motor shaft is going you know one direction and the other direction very rapidly between those two directions and it never really makes a full revolution. One major point that I want to make here is if you're ever dealing with any sort of abnormal behavior from your power system the best thing to do is to just stop and the reason why you want to do this is you don't want to go and push your power system beyond its thermal capabilities and blow a power system component out due to heat. Ultimately what's happening when these issues arise is a bunch of power is being transferred from one component to another and if this builds up over the course of a very small period of time you can actually overheat these components. If you still need to investigate what's actually happening with your power system just let the power system cool down measure the components and try it again later for a very split second of time. This way you don't destroy anything. Now ultimately if you are dealing with this type of issue where you're seeing this type of stuttering or vibration happening in your power system and you want to make sure that the contact between each one of those wires and connection points is 100% secure. This way it can effectively and efficiently transfer power from the ESC to the motor. Now let's jump into the sixth item here on our list and this deals with the ESC calibration. This is an issue that pops up actually more frequently than you could imagine and it really deals with guys who are changing power systems in their radio control vehicle from the factory one to let's say an aftermarket one for more performance. When you go through this process the ESC is of a different brand and maybe you even change the radio too. Now one of the biggest things in order for your vehicle to even work at all you have to have the ESC properly 
programmed or armed with the radio that you are using. Now you can go through the instruction manual to get this process down pat, but ultimately what needs to happen is your ESC needs to know the neutral position of your radio. That's when the trigger is not in the brake position or in the throttle position for a pistol grip style radio. Another point here is that the ESC needs to know when you're hitting maximum throttle versus when you're hitting maximum brake. If you're flying a radio control airplane, the same idea happens except you know the minimum throttle it needs to know that position as well as the maximum throttle the ESC needs to know both of those positions if it doesn't have it or if it's got it reversed you're not going to allow that ESC to properly arm now the other thing is even if your ESC is to arm it may not see a hundred percent throttle what I like to do even after I get to arm is I run the radio control vehicle I take a data log of everything going on board my power system and I go and review that if I see that that the ESC is only putting out 94% power when I know that I squeeze the, tr the throttle 100% of the way, this tells me that the ESC does not properly understand where the end point of my radio is as I pull the trigger. And I want to recalibrate the ESC to avoid this issue of not delivering 100% throttle when I need 100% throttle. Another thing I like to pay attention to is if I do pull the trigger about 50% of the way, that I'm not hitting 100% throttle and nothing after that trigger position does anything. I want to make sure that everything is as expected from 0 to 100% throttle. Now let's jump into the seventh item on our list and this deals with manufacturing defects. Now unfortunately we live in a world where nothing is perfect and the same applies to our radio controlled hobby. Now in some cases I can give you even an example where I was trying to fly my radio control airplane, I was ready for a takeoff after using this for multiple different years, I apply some throttle and right away that ESC goes up in flames. A very unfortunate event, however I did get lucky that the ESC was the only thing that was damaged, the plane was okay. This is an example of what could possibly happen and if you're wondering, you know, I thought I did everything right but I can't understand why this would happen, well sometimes manufacturing defects do occur and this could be the reason why one of your components had failed. I hope this doesn't happen to you but if it does keep this in the back of your mind because not everything is the user's fault or the pilot's fault as it's put. So let's jump into the last item here on our list which deals with the environmental type issue. This is an issue that only really applies to you if you live in colder climates or climates that deal with colder temperatures. Now cold temperature for many is below the freezing mark. Once you get below the freezing mark of water, this is where the environment becomes very degrading on our battery that is used in the radio controlled hobby. Lithium polymer battery packs really don't like cold temperatures and what typically happens when we see these cold temperatures is performance of the pack drops both in the amount of current that that battery can actually provide to you so its C rating is actually changing as well as the total amount of capacity that it can deliver. What I would recommend if you are going to fly a plane or drive a radio control car in these colder climates is to make sure that you understand and know that the total amount of runtime that you have is significantly reduced. Don't over drain the battery because that is just going to either get you into trouble if you're flying a radio controlled airplane or it can get you into trouble for the actual lifespan of that pack by permanently damaging it if you continue to use it past that 20% charge status. Well guys that pretty well does it for the top eight items here of common issues with RC brushless power systems. Hope you enjoyed the video. As always, like the video if you did. Don't forget to hit that sub button so I can see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching. See you in the next one.